We're going to be talking about high frequency stuff today. And that's millimeter wave and terahertz. So I'm talking uh, in the giga, in the uh, above 50 gigahertz, above 100 gigahertz, or 1,000 gigahertz. And what are those applications? And there's one headline I want to, I want to make sure you, you realize is, 10 years ago, these frequencies were research topics. Now there are commercial applications driving growth in this area. And I'm going to explain what that is. So I'll talk about some of the markets that are use, utilizing millimeter wave technologies. What are, what are some of those technologies? And then some, what are these measurements? What, what do they look like? So again, I'm, I'm coming at this from a network analyzer perspective. And with a network analyzer, it's we test stuff we can hold. You can hold in your hand. You may need a micro, well, maybe you maybe can't hold in your hand, but it's something real. It's a physical test. You might need a microscope to see it. You might need a crane to hold it up. That's what network analyzers test, something as simple as a, as a little IC all the way up to a satellite payload or a radar antenna, a transmit receive module. That's to differentiate from a spectrum analyzer, which you can't see what you're testing. It's all, all the signals in the air. And all that stuff we all develop and, and, uh, and make in Santa Rosa here at, at the Keysight Technologies. In fact, I started, those of you that know Dr. Estrich, I, I started, that's where I started, in, uh, where he worked for years, in our High Frequency Technology Center. I enjoyed it, but I, I enjoyed more trying to get our internal people to use our ICs than I did designing the ICs. So that led to a career in marketing for, for about 20 years. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about, is millimeter wave. If you have questions, please just raise your hand or blurt out. I'm very informal. So these things right here, this is a, a network analyzer right here with some millimeter wave extenders that allow it to go to higher frequencies and, uh, and, and different types of test equipment, network analyzers, uh, spectrum analyzers, or oscilloscopes. But we're going to start with a quiz. So SI units get you in the right frame of mind. So you guys all know what a, what a millimeter is. So on the top measures, we're going to get into the wavelength. So what's the next one? Mega. Mega, OK. What's 10 to the minus 9? Nano. Oh, no, sorry, on the top, nano, right? Well, about nanomaterials, right? That's a big deal. What, what about down below? OK, good. What's next on the top? Pico. 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 Very good. Okay, you heard things like Pico cells, Femto cells. These are small little base stations. So you, we can all talk and send data anywhere we want at any time. Or Terra. So we're going to stop here, terahertz today. But there's more. Femto. Okay. What do you think the next one after Terra is? Peta. Yeah, nothing to do with, uh, wasn't there a character in, uh, yeah, that's what um, I forgot that. I know Jennifer Lawrence is in it, but what's it called? Hunger Games. Hunger Games, thank you. <laughs> okay. And Addo, what's next on the bottom? Are you guys on Google or something on your phones? No? <laughs> Up on the top? Zepto, 10 to the minus 21. What's, what's next on 10 to the 21? Zeta. And then one more on the top, Yakto. And on the bottom, a yada. So why is that important? Well, the rest mass of a proton is about 1.7 yaktograms. Pretty light. Visible wavelength is between 4 and 700 nanometers. Wavelength at 300 terahertz is about a micron. There are process control systems using 300 or, or uh, these high frequencies to monitor things like chocolate. Is the size of the chocolate the right way? Are the hazelnuts in the right place? It's automated process control. Wavelength at 300 gigahertz is a millimeter. At the terahertz, 300 microns. And age of the universe is 0.43 exaseconds. And the energy, or the mass of the Earth, 5.9 zettatons. And then finally, the power of the sun, 385 yotta watts. A lot of watts. I, so again, now you can 
take this while your friends at the, at the, the next picture or tomorrow night in the, in the dorms or wherever you guys are. Okay. This is what we're talking about today. So this is a is this thing right here in the middle, this, this oval. This is a chart of the frequency spectrum, wavelength across here, what the associated frequency is, or 1 over, and what are the, the size reference, right? So 100, 100, meter, 100 meters, football field, person's height, paper clip uh, right here. The, what are the applications? So mobile phones, mostly around 2.5 gigahertz, going up to 5.8 wireless LAN today. 2.4, 5.8 radar, 1 to 100 gigahertz. Then you get into this terahertz in millimeter wave area, things like bioimaging. We'll see a few examples of that. Screening. Anybody been in an airport and you've done this and stood there? 60 gigahertz. It's safe, but that's what you're, that's the last stuff you can see, believe me. As you start to get into the ultraviolet, there's dental curing. Anybody that's had stuff done in their mouth understand that. Of course, medical x-rays, etc. So but we're going to focus on this area here, about 50 gigahertz to a terahertz. So a lot of our products at Keysight developed here in Sonoma County are all in this RF and microwave area. So what are some of these markets? Let's talk about those markets and, and the applications. So you guys have all heard of Cisco. In fact, they bought a company here called Serent several years ago. And I think that's the names on the building. Yeah. And uh, I had a neighbor that worked for Serent. He's now happily retired with <laughs> lots of houses in nice places. But uh, they, they do a, a, a forecast every year. And let me show some of the things that they've talked about. So the annual global IP traffic will surpass 1.4 zettabytes. Remember the, the SI prefixes? That's 1.4 with, I think, 20 zeros. 22 zeros after it. That's a lot of bytes. Global mobile data traffic grew 70% in 2012. It grew 75 and 13, and it grew 85 and 14. It's an insatiable demand. Does anybody here not have a smartphone? I hear brave, brave soul. My, my daughters laugh at me because I just want, the, I love the Razor. Yeah. Has anybody ever heard of the Motorola Razor? <laughs> I want mine back. That's what I love. And, and I'm, my kids laugh at me because I'm the, you know, Dad, can I go to Jenny's house? Can I do this? So, well, and then there's about five questions back and forth with the text. Just call. You have a nice phone. But the phone isn't used for voice anymore. But I wouldn't give up my iPhone now. It's way too valuable. I don't know how we, we live without it. But so mobile data traffic. Traffic from wireless and mobile devices will exceed traffic from wired devices by 2016. They've revised that. It's going to be this year. So does anybody here not have a wired phone where you just rely on wireless? That's becoming very prevalent. Even for, sorry, people that worked at Bell in, in the past. What's the wired phone? Pardon me? What's, uh, a, what's wired? a wired phone? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, when my kids ask me, what's a floppy disk? Um, mobile data traffic can increase 13-fold to, to exabytes. By the end of 13, this is, and this, this did occur. And then the average smartphone will generate 2.7 gigabytes of traffic per month. So it's just an insatiable demand for all of us to get data. I had a cool movie. I'm going to send it to you. And you can get it right here. It's just data, data, downloads, sending it, et cetera. So that's what's, what's driving this. But all that data requires what? Bandwidth. Not a lot of bandwidth between 3 and 6 gigahertz anymore. So got to go higher frequency. So why millimeter wave and terahertz? So why, why going to 50 gigahertz, 500 gigahertz? Why, what's driving that in the world? It's communications driving growth and investment. It's consumer. It's you and I. It's, we want to talk to each other, send data back and forth. So again, I mentioned previously, 10 years ago, millimeter wave and terahertz, it were research projects. Now it's, it's real. It's driven. And whenever there's a consumer-driven demand, costs come down rapidly. 5G. How many have heard the term 5G? I could ask you all to write down what it is. You'd probably give me a different answer, but it's the, the next generation of mobile 
communications. So 4G is happening right now. Some people call 4G LTE or long-term evolution. 1G was the big Motorola brick analog phones. 2G was the first digital communication system. So GSM from, came from Europe, Group Space Automobile. 3G was starting to get wideband CDMA, more digital formats. And 4G is just increasing the bandwidth with more exotic uh, spread spectrum techniques. 5G is the next one. So what 5G is driving investment into E-band. Who can tell me what E-band is? It's 60 to 90 gigahertz. So it's, it's a lot, of, it's a high frequency. So that's E-band. It's 5G is going to be 100 times faster. So when you download some, it should be five, five to 100 times faster than your current phone. So you're not standard. And this is over, this is not in Wi-Fi, this is mobile connection. Very low latency. It's a fancy term for when you hit hit return, you got it. You're not waiting. It's tactile. So it, probably some gamers in here, you want it fast. Thousand-fold gains in capacity. Zero distance connectivity. That's what Huawei says. Anybody heard of Huawei? Yeah, they're, they're the Cisco from China. Yeah. And while they're they're everywhere. But they, uh, that's what they call it. So no matter where you are in the world, you can get data from anywhere else. Unlimited access to information for anyone and anything. So Huawei's biggest competitor in this area is Ericsson. I was at Huawei, their central research labs in uh, Chengdu, China last, last year. They're doing development at 94 gigahertz for 5G and research at 325. Lots of challenges that I'll talk about with that in terms of like antennas and signal generation. How do you get that kind of power at that frequency? It can be expensive. Uh, and they asked me a lot of questions if I had been to Ericsson. Very competitive company. But data follows you. It's gigabit everywhere and no cell edges. Who likes drop calls? I live in Bent Valley. at and is horrible there. And it's a major investment area for big players here. I was in Docomo in Japan, so Japan's hosting the 2020 Olympics. They want their communications network to be perfect and very elaborate and very uh, high capacity. So there's some traditional millimeter wave aerospace and defense. So there are radar programs at 94 gigahertz that will continue. And then um, atmospheric research, radio astronomy, those are all at terahertz frequencies, and that will continue. Weather kinds of research, those sorts of things. Millimeter wave communications equipment grow 40% a year to the year 2020. There's plenty of available spectrum. And it's wide. So at 60 gigahertz, there's not a lot of radio stations. There's not a lot of cell phone traffic. There's not a lot of base station traffic. At 60 gigahertz today, there is some cellular traffic because that's what happens in the rural areas of the country. We call it microwave backhaul. So the signals are are routed around the country in these rural areas at, at those frequencies, nice short wavelengths. And the millimeter wave frequencies are useful for dense areas. It's much lower cost than laying fiber. So one of the benefits of millimeter wave is it's, it's very pointed. The signal at 100 gigahertz is very directional. So you can point it where you want it. Now you can't go as far. The power isn't as high. But for dense urban areas, it's very, very useful. It's also when your wavelengths are that small, the equipment is much smaller, you can create mobile or agile base stations. You want to create a, a huge communications network for an event, say the Super Bowl, because then you got 100,000 people in a stadium that all want to take their selfies and send it to their friends simultaneously. You need a network to be able to handle that. So there are these agile mobile networks at millimeter wave frequencies. You can put the Super Bowl, the Olympics for three weeks, and then you can move it. So it's a temporary base station or communications network. Again, all driven um, by millimeter wave frequencies. So what is 5G? Today it's best described as a set of new requirements for wireless communication systems for the future. It's going to be revolutionary, not evolutionary. It's, going to, it's all about speed and density. It's going to use a variety of radio technologies. You may have heard of, I use LTE, 5G, Wi-Fi will all be part of the solution. 
And when I use Wi-Fi here, I'm talking about things like 60 gigahertz. So that's, that's the, the, what we call the Wi-Fi alliance. It's, it's 60 gigahertz. It's not, uh, not, not your stereo. 60 gigahertz being able to do huge data packets across short, short distances simultaneously, immediately. I've talked about all these things right here. Uh, I'll skip that here in the interest of time. So 5G, so what do we believe? So in, our, in my business, we're saying, how much should we invest here? If, if, the whole, if the whole community, you know, about a third of my business is wireless communications, I have to look at this, because if I'm not ahead of this, then how are all the people that are developing these networks, the base stations, the phones that are going to use 5G, we want them to buy lots of test equipment, network analyzers and spectrum analyzers or cell phone testers. So we're looking at this. What it means, it's, uh, it's going to be much higher frequencies because there's just no more room below 6 gigahertz. There, just, there isn't any. So it's 10 to 50, 60, 70 to 80, even 325 gigahertz. The nice thing about the higher frequencies is there's bandwidth available. You know, an LTE signal is about 5 megahertz. Now we got gigahertz of frequency bandwidth that, that is available. I'm ignoring for the moment all of the things like FCC auctions and, and that sort of thing. That, that will Governments aren't stupid. They're going to grab their, their share of the, this bandwidth as well. There will be new physical technologies. So I won't go into all of these. These are all things that uh, different ways of, 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 of looking at the frequency spectrum. New antenna technologies, steerable array antennas. Have you heard the term MIMO? Anybody heard that term MIMO? So multiple in, multiple output antennas. It's fascinating if you look. I have a, 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 a picture, a block diagram of a, of a phone from a company in the South Bay. I'm not allowed to use their name because they don't like it. If I use their name, it's in the South Bay. And I think it's a fruit. That they, I have a picture or a schematic of the iPhone 4. You know how many power amplifiers are in that thing? So you got GPS, you got Bluetooth, you got Wi Fi, and five different formats for global computers. Eight power amplifiers. They all have to have antennas. And they all do funny things when they talk to each other. And they radiate off walls, or, so there's a lot of interesting testing. Imagine that now at 60 gigahertz, 70 gigahertz. How do you do that? And how do you make an affordable antenna? So right now, the antenna in your iPhone or your Samsung Galaxy is, is, is pennies. And to do that at gigahertz is lots of dollars. So there will be interoperation, integration with lots of, of different radio technologies, including unlicensed. So there's a lot of people that are transmitting at 60 gigahertz today. Whether it's legal or not, I, I'm not going to comment. But they have they've built their own transmitters, so they all have to figure out how to work together. A lot more backhaul capacity. I talked about what backhaul is. And um, again, higher frequencies and higher densities will dictate small cells. So what are some other applications? I've talked about um, backhaul. So why is it nice? So this is on the frequency on the x-axis in the what we call sea level attenuation. So what happens, just the signal just getting absorbed by the atmosphere. So there, when you look at this, there are some nice areas here where the attenuation is lower. So you can see here, this is E-band, 60 to 90 gigahertz. There's some properties of just our atmosphere that are beneficial for signal propagation at those frequencies. That's why the microwave oven operates at 2.58 gigahertz. There's some really nice water absorption. Water absorbs heat very, very quickly at that frequency. So there's also some here around 180 to 200 gigahertz. So you, you like designing here. Here, there's too much loss. And generating power, by the way, you're going to have a lecture next time about how you generate these, this, these signals at gigahertz and terahertz frequencies. It's expensive. We have, for example, synthesizers or, or microwave signal generators that generate signals at 50 gigahertz. So for a high performance microwave signal generator, which means it has you know, plenty of power, maybe plus 15 dBm, and very clean power, 
very low phase noise, very few harmonics. You're gonna, you pay about $1,000 per gigahertz. So $50,000 50, for a 50 gigahertz synthesizer. And then to take it to 500 gigahertz, you, you add extenders and that adds, adds another $100,000. So to generate this power, you don't wanna lose it in the atmosphere. You wanna be able to keep as much of it as you can. So these are all things you, you may hear about. So if you heard of YGIG, the Wireless Gigabit Alliance, um, 802.11 AD is the latest, 60 gigahertz. It's the the Wi-Fi network in your house, starting to move those to 60 gigahertz. And all that together has become what's now called the Wi-Fi Alliance. And they're focused very much on 802.11 AD. You ever go into Fry's or uh, Best Buy and you know, 802.11.BCG, you know, this is the latest. So another one, radar. So this is a chip right here that's been uh, developed by a, a gentleman at, well, a team at IBM several years ago. It's 32 receivers and six, 16 transmitters, dual polarized. It's at 95 gigahertz. It's being used both in data communication applications and radar. So you, you can see the size of it right here. And then one that I like, automotive radar. 10 years ago, your Mercedes and your BMWs had automotive radars. Today, I gotta be careful. The, uh, anybody have a Kia Rio? It has 14 radars on it. So every car has it. It's come down in price, and that operates around 77 gigahertz. So whether it's speed control, now the automatic parking, that's not radar, that's, that's visual or uh, um, optical. But there's 14 radars, and it's in all the cars. And that, that's just fascinating to me, the, the radars that are in there. Of that Bosch in Germany, they make, they make automotive radar. We're working with them, how can you test it? They, what's nice is 10 years ago, they did go, no go testing. Now it's like the volumes have gone up so they can afford, and they, now they have to do full 100% testing, and that's nice for us. We have to buy our equipment. So spectroscopy. So spectroscopy is a fancy word for how does matter interact with radiated energy. And this has some really interesting applications. So what I'm showing here, this is the beat frequency in terahertz versus absorption coefficient. So how is something absorbed? And there's two different examples. So lactose, or body tissue, and RDX. So Homeland Security does this kind of stuff. So at what you're seeing here at 600 gigahertz or 0.6 terahertz, you, you hit plastic explosive with that frequency, it gives a specific absorption result. So that's a, what we call a terahertz signature. So you can immediately see, oh, that's bad. So in airports, in the freight areas, they have these kinds of machines, a company called TerraView. They make these and our stuff goes through it. Not, not necessarily your bag, but the stuff that's been, that goes under the plane, goes through that to, to check for things like plastic explosive. You may have heard of, of radar signatures. So there's you know, radars on planes and things like that, on, on not 740, well they have them too, but on, uh, in the military, certain radars put out certain signatures. And so they can detect it all with this kind of frequency. So that's a, you know, maybe not a pleasant application, you know, looking for explosives. But you can think of different kinds of medical materials that can be tested and looking for ways to do non-invasive medical uh, procedures. So cancerous tissue, for example, has a different response than healthy tissue. I have a question. Uh, in uh, detecting uh, um, the, uh, let's say the explosive material and so on, Basically, you are looking for the loss, loss of the thing because that's where it's speaking, yeah? The loss of the thing. Yeah, the, how much it absorbs. How, how much of the stimulus energy is absorbed. Right, yeah. yeah. So let me summarize all these markets. So there's radio astronomy. Certainly, that's in the terahertz region. So this is a picture of the square kilometer array in, uh, in Chile, about 10,000 feet. 
looking for, this is a plastic knife, that's at 60 gigahertz. Small cell backhaul I talked about, so it's like in an urban area, different frequency ranges. So these red ones are the, are the higher frequencies. Looking at these little micro cells, so those are little base stations. Now we have a key site, we have our own little base stations inside the building. Automotive radar, all the different, talked about the different radars that are in a, uh, in a car, all, all operating at 77 gigahertz. Talked about the Wi-Fi alliance, even digital circuits. This is a board um, from, a, uh, from Intel, looking at passing signals on a computer backplane at 60 gigahertz. So at 60 gigahertz, pulses, square pulses, are no longer square. They're, they do lots of funny things. Looking at, uh, at radar, so this radar here, you can't see it, but this is at 95 gigahertz. Why is that important? So that the radar can see these small little wires. Why is that important? Where are most of the helicopters being flown today? A lot of sand. And you can't see the wires, but the radar can see it. This is a 300 gigahertz radar image of a bicycle. The wavelength at 300 gigahertz is four nanometers. So why is that interesting? I talked about process control, about the chocolates. So I actually have a bag of gummy bears, that, and there's a, it's a Fraunhofer Institute, and they have these manufacturing systems, and they're, they, it's a process control. It's a, kind of expensive for the moment, but the idea is it's, it's a very fast and very accurate process control for manufacturing of items, whether they're food items like chocolates to make sure they're all the same size, the, the Swiss chocolate is the same size, and the hazelnuts are in the right place, or the gummy bears are all uniform, or whatever, whatever the item is. So it's, again, at 300 gigahertz, it's just a simple, simple radar. So you, you stimulate the, the device under test. It might hear, hear the case. It's a bicycle, and, and you can see everything. In the military sense, radar development now is, you know, in the past, there's a lot more radar work looking for ships and planes. There's a lot more work now looking for people. So smaller wavelengths and to get much more resolution, higher frequencies. And I'm not trying to scare you, it's, it's just it's real world. That's, that's what's out there. So I talk about process control. Tank probing. Shell oil uses millimeter wave frequencies to probe oil tanks. One millimeter of depth in an oil tank is hundreds of thousands of dollars. I didn't know that. So they're doing they're doing stimulus response measurements without somebody getting in right, and measuring it. They can do it from the top and they can see how much oil they have. It's not one one inch. Sorry, not one millimeter, but one inch is th hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's what tank probing is again taking a very high frequency signal, stimulating a material device and seeing its response. Talked about spectroscopy, atmospheric, characterizing all different kinds of material, materials, biological imaging, even non-lethal um, weapon systems. So those are the markets. So why, why are these markets going or growing? It's spectrum and bandwidth available. Millimeter wave is very advantageous, dense areas. You got the bandwidth. It's very efficient in the spectrum. Provides agility to implement and this is another important one that I haven't touched on yet. It's easier to make these devices now. You used to have to have a real expensive gallium arsenide foundry like the one we have in Santa Rosa, where you, you, you make an IC and you start wafer, you are you're, you're getting close to millions of dollars to develop a, a full-featured integrated circuit. But now silicon germanium and CMOS, you can get to 60 gigahertz pretty wouldn't say it's cheap. You don't just do it in your garage, but it's a lot easier to get to these higher frequencies uh, than we could in the past. So any questions on the markets? What's the fastest or the highest frequency anyone's built and who is it? Like, is there a company leading the, leading the chart? Right? The highest frequency, uh, it would all be in the research area. It's, it's in, the, in that spectrum chart. It's Companies like Fraunhofer Institute, they've been well beyond a couple terahertz. 
in generating signals, in detecting and measuring um, MIT Lincoln Labs, which is a, a government, United States government research facility in, at MI, near MIT in the Boston area. They've I've seen theirs about four to five terahertz, but that's all that I know. What's the highest you guys can test for? Uh, 1.1 terahertz. It's the highest that we've done. It gets expensive. Not a lot of people doing that at that at, at a terahertz. 300 gigahertz and below? Absolutely. Okay. So what are the technologies here? I thought there's CMOS and si silicon germanium, but a lot of times the performance is taken for granted. You know, you can get you can go well to Radio Shack as long as they're still in business. <laughs> And you can buy parts to build your own network analyzer or your own spectrum analyzer or your own RF source. You literally can. Now, it's not going to be the performance of a, maybe a key site product, but you can do it. You can get the parts there to build little circuits for your classes here. Absolutely. But to do that at 100 gigahertz or 300 gigahertz, is, that's not so easy. You got, you, you know, cable lengths matter. When you, if you have a, a, a cable at 100 gigahertz and you just go like that, that can cause, you know, the wavelength is so small, so a small phase change translates to a huge error, if you will. There's also getting wide bandwidth. You know, how do you get, you know, from five, her five megahertz of modulation bandwidth to one to ten gigahertz? And all those modulation schemes that allow us to pack more data into a given piece of bandwidth. And then there's no connectors. One of the nice things about microwave and, and two and a half gigahertz, you know, if I have a filter or an amplifier, I can put a SMA, have you ever heard of the SMA connector or a type N connector? Or, a, you know, the connector like for your cable, right? That's like a, some, that's a kind of a fancy BNC. <coughs> that's, those work great below 20 gigahertz, not above. So there's no, there's the, connect, the uh, like a coaxial connector. The highest one that exists commercially goes to 110 gigahertz. So beyond that, we use Waveguide. Anybody had a class here in Waveguide? Yeah, I, that's taught. And then you have the professors that you learn everything in rectangular, and then in the final, it's a it's a spherical Waveguide, which doesn't exist in the real world, but you have to take the test anyway. It's just a math a math final. Yeah. But, but that, 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 so it's hard. How do you connect from from the test equipment or just within your own whatever it is your device, your product operating at these frequencies? How do you connect to it? Those connections don't exist above 110 gigahertz. And the nice things like microstrip and things like that, they fall apart <laughs> at, a, at, a, at 110 gigahertz. So this is a, an article. This is a, if you ever were interesting, this is about eight years ago. You heard of IEEE Spectrum magazine? And this gentleman wrote, because there was a lot of to do about gigahertz and terahertz several years ago, and he basically said it's, uh, it's impossible, that it's just too hard because what happens is here, you're, again, that's the, the loss versus frequency. So the, the energy is absorbed. The higher you go in frequency, look at all that energy loss compared to what you have down here. So he said it really can't be used to detect chemicals at a distance. It can. It's been proven wrong doesn't penetrate, you can't see inside the body. Anybody been at an airport? You, it's penetrating inside your body. It, it is. I, just the way it is. Power sources are inefficient. 1%. Well, that's, we've about tenfold improved that now. It's useful for radio astronomy and space remote sense. That's true because there's not loss up there. It's, it still does that. May eventually be useful for very short range communications. Eventually is now gone. It is useful. So it's interesting. The article basically that panned gigahertz and terror is very controversial at the time, but uh, it, it's it is so. And his his whole point was everybody loves it because they like to say the word terahertz. That's why it's popular. But it's it's uh, it's actually very useful. So semiconductor devices, higher Fs of T's or higher operating frequencies. So. Silicon geranium, heterojunction bipolar transistors. Here's silicon CMOS, 3,5 hemp's, 3,5 HBTs. And you can see over, over time, in our own foundry here, similar, the higher Fs of T's. So here in 2010, here's eight, 750 gigahertz, and it's continuing to go up. 
So here's a company we work with. It's called Virginia Diodes Incorporated. They're located in Charlottesville, Virginia. And they make millimeter wave and terahertz products that combine with our, our products. So they use nonlinear devices to extend the frequency range of traditional microwave electronics. So we have, so traditional microwave electronic piece might be an amplifier, might be a signal generator, might be a, a mixer or a down converter or an up converter. So in this case, the microwave technology, very simple block diagram, a, an oscillator here. I mean, you can't buy a 16.7 gigahertz oscillator at, at Radio Shack. You might have to you know, get something at, at analog devices, or in the case of, of Keysight, we make our own. Then you have this thing called a multiplier or a times three. It has filters in there, it has amplifiers, it's diode. And so 16.7 in, and you get 40 gigahertz out. And this might be a Keysight signal generator. Then this company, VDI, they take that 40 gigahertz signal and they, with the diode, they have a times eight multiplier. So you go from 40 to 320 gigahertz. Now you've gone from one and a half watts to 20 milliwatts, so you, you, there is a payment to do that. But 20 milliwatts at 320 gigahertz is still a nice, nice amount of power. So how do they do that? They have here in this area, they have these Schottky diodes, famous. You guys have all have heard of Schottky, I assume. Um, and they have a, their own fabrication facility. So this is looking at it with, uh, it's called a scanning electron microscope, looking at the, at the diode itself. And of course they use CAD design. Do, you, do the students here get to use CAD design? We, have, we do have access. Yeah. You have access to it, or you gotta use Smith charts and... Yeah. We have one, the uh, site. Oh yeah, the ADS. Software. Okay, all right. So that's an example of, of a source getting, so here, 320 gigahertz source. A little more about the, the Schottky diodes. So you have the anode here and the, and the gold finger. You got gallium arsenide here in the substrate, uh, different uh, resistant contacts. So again, cutoff frequency is well into the terahertz and it's uh, well modeled with uh, current voltage uh, and capacitor voltage equations. I'm not going to go hit through here. I don't know how to do these math, this math anymore. That's, that's what you guys do. That, that was uh, when I was in your place, I learned how to do that. Uh, they fabricate these things all themselves. Um, they're, they're very mechanically rugged. It's a flip chip. It's a packaging technology. They integrate it with different circuitry right here. So plain, these are the planar diodes looking at it from above. This is, again, with that scanning uh, electron microscope. So it's a really neat, interesting place. It's a... It's an offshoot from University of Virginia, uh, three former professors that started that. They also do mixers. Has anybody ever worked with a mixer? It's a little more complicated because you got you know two two frequent two inputs. You got a local oscillator input and an RF. Then you get the you get the intermediate frequency, which is the RF minus two times the LO. But you also get the RF plus two times the LO and all these other mixing products. So it, it's a, they're very nice receivers. But you can see. You know, mixers are available all the way to, to uh, 2.8 terahertz. And, and you can see the performance. Here's frequency, gigahertz, and the noise performance. This is what it would look like. It's a little microcircuit right there. It's, it's about, uh, you know, about this big. A little gold brick, we call them. To, the price of one of these is about $25,000. So what about some measurements? How do you do this? So here's an example, RF and photonics. So using CW or RF frequencies as well as light in the same system. So here, this is a system, this is an oscilloscope and being able to, so using a photonic or an optical mixer to combine two data. So there's two data streams being combined right here and you get 100 gigabits per second over 20 meters. Who cares, 100 gig, what does that mean? Well, you can download five DVDs in two seconds. Now, this isn't available yet at Best Buy. You, this, you know, it's a $60,000 oscilloscope, <laughs> and, and these uh, ODE transmitters are kind of expensive, but that's the research that's going on. So, photonics, if you, I don't know if you have a photonics class here. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a merger of mic high frequency signals and, and light waves. So it's radio over fiber, low loss uh, distribution. 
and again, you can take advantage of the vast bandwidth. And if you can do these ICs, it's you don't have to worry. When you can use light, you don't have to. You don't have that connector problem I talked about earlier, and it's much smaller and lower power dissipation. But you're not going to get the same performance. But again, so you're you're using optical techniques combined with electrical techniques to get these high frequencies to again be able to transmit data quickly. It's just in the research phase now. This is an example of what we do at Keysight. So we have our own fab, up, 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 not upstairs, but up, up in Santa Rosa. So we have material scientists, device physics. In fact, the gentleman right here was, a, was one of our device physicists, as I recall. Um, we have our own process technologies, and of course we do the fab, we do all kinds of reliability and statistics. We have our own designers, and all this stuff ends up in our own equipment. So I think you had a, uh, a presentation on this a year ago. That was one of the most fun projects I ever got to lead. Okay, so what measurements do you make? So who cares about these things? Who buys this, this kind of equipment? Well, so here's an example. This is, this is one of, this is my flagship product. It's called a PNAX network analyzer, and I won't, I won't give you a sales pitch on it, but it's the best network analyzer in the world. <laughs> it just kicks butt. And it's being used to test something that's pretty tough, the 70 to 90 gigahertz transceiver. So what's that being used for? It's being used in microwave backhaul all over the world. So these loop this, and, it, and uh, it's a receiver and a transmitter at the same time. And it's in the F2, so it's in these base stations in rural areas, in Nebraska, the Dakotas, all over Canada. But how do you test this thing to make sure it works? This radio. And you think about satellites. Satellite's a big business for us. Because they, when you launch a satellite, that's a lot of money. It has to work. So they've got to test it and test it and test it. So we have, we have great customers, Space Systems, Laurel, and customers like that. SpaceX, you heard of them? SpaceX has ideas to put you know, hundreds of little, using higher frequencies, little satellites. To, to generate much more data traffic and, or handle much more data traffic. They were, in fact, at our, at our site all day. I, I, I wore the tie for them. But uh, that it's, it's satellite is a big business. But again, it's, it's testing is important. But this, this particular product, and they won't let me show a picture of it because they have competitors. It's a, it's, a, it's a little part, 70, 90 gigahertz. And I'll, I'll show a block diagram of it in a minute. But this is how we, how we test it. So this particular product, goes to 50 gigahertz, uh, or 67, pardon me, and then we add these extenders to go to 60 to 90 and to make these tests. But here's what they need to test. So this is my business as measurement. So the transmitter, what's its conversion efficiency, and what are the S parameters? Have you heard of S parameters? It's a fancy term, right? S parameters are, are just basically it's gain and loss and match. How well, how well the device is matched to 50 ohms. So that's what S parameters are. It, it basically, it's, it's how you characterize the device. This is a filter, you put signal into it. Or if this is a device, does it filter it? Does it attenuate it? Does it amplify it? What does it do to it? So that's the S parameters are characterize the device. Of the transmitter. What's the spectrum of the transmitter when you apply the RF power? What's the spectrum of the transmitter for LO leakage? So this, the, the LO, tends to leak signals, and et cetera. Lots of different measurements that need to be made. And these are not easy measurements. I don't want to imply that they're, they're easy. So this is a, a simple block diagram of the device. It's all, all in, a, uh, in a, about a, it's about this big. So you've got a 9 gigahertz LO embedded inside the, the part itself. That's a times 8. You got a 74 gigahertz output, and you got an 84 gigahertz output. So let's say the device under test is an E-band millimeter wave to IF receiver down converter and an IF to E-band millimeter wave transmitter up converter. In the uh, in this area, it has WR12 waveguide. Here, it has SMA. SMA can I don't know what SMA stands for. Right? So you've heard of Type N connectors, right? Those are those are the very nice rugged BNC, those little 
those are bayonet naval connectors. That's what it stands for. So if you never, if you didn't know, you can amaze your friends uh, what a BNC is. It has six ports, and they needed to test this in production. When they started this project, when we first got there, they had racks of equipment to test. They had spectrum analyzers. They had signal generators. They had network analyzers. Just to calibrate it all it took them more than a day. To make the test took them a day for one part. And they're getting, they need to ship you know, hundreds of these every week. It's not like cell phones where it's millions every week, but hundreds of these radios every week. So this is what the test system looks like. Their device actually sits in here because this is a special fixture that was created because they're also, at the same time as they're testing it, they're, we're doing it over all those tests over temperature and humidity. So this is a little fixture that allows them to inject temperature and humidity. Because these things are sitting out in, you know, minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 10 C all the way up to, to 100 degrees Fahrenheit and then some. So the device is in here, and there's lots of cables, but so what happens in the end, here's another picture, the device is sitting in here. But this is what it looks like. So here is the sweat power of the transmitter, so I'm looking at this frequency, this is power on the x-axis now. So at, at 84 gigahertz, so you're, you ever measured an amplifier, you see the green one here is the output power, and then you see the compression happening. So this, this is all done simultaneously, all these measurements. I won't go through all of them, but this is hard stuff. This was hard to do before that product I showed you that we have. So he said makes this take the test fixture? No, this, they make it their own. No, they, the test fixture they made themselves. We made all, everything else you saw there we provided. Yeah. So material measurements. So here, here we go. Here's another network analyzer operating at a terahertz and these are the up converters that take you from 67 gigahertz to a terahertz and this is a little fixture here and you put little pieces of material in here and that material could be could be anything it, it, but in this case it's it's a, a semiconductor material that's used on PC board this is a company that's trying to figure out how to make PC board here at Rogers material the material that's on a printed circuit board, we'd love to get that to work at 100 gigahertz or higher because it's cheaper. You can mass produce it instead of these nice those gold micro circuits that, that, that are in our instruments. We love those too. Great performance, but they're they're costly. So we in at millimeter wave, we have to drive the cost down, and we, and we won't be successful. But material measurements at high frequency is interesting. So. If you ever look at the properties of water, 21 gigahertz, it's, it's, a, it's the absorption coefficient at 21 gigahertz is, is, is the maximum. And there's a derivative of that, 2.58 gigahertz, which is why the microwave oven works at that frequency. You can get parts for that very cheaply when Litton, or Amana, whoever did it first, I think it was Litton, um, and they created the, the microwave oven. 21 gigahertz can be a little, and microwave ovens would be a lot more expensive. But 21 gigahertz, a network analyzer at that frequency was used to develop Pampers. So I don't know if you have kids, I have three. Oh, they're, they're all your age and older now. But the material inside Pampers is meant to be very absorptive. And at, so it, they were using, a, like this, not quite at one terahertz, but they put the diaper material right in the middle of this fixture stimulate it with 21 gigahertz of energy and measure the S parameters of diaper fluff and then calculate mathematically permittivity and permeability or the absorptive capabilities of that material. Make changes to the material and then uh, optimize it and that created Pampers. It's done at a lab in Japan. So it's fascinating what you can do with these high frequencies. So here's a 110 gigahertz using a, a quasi-optical. Again, it's, it's just a different technique to measure materials. It's, uh, here it's a transmitter. You're reflecting it off a mirror. You put the device under test in the middle, which is right here, through another mirror to the receiver. It's a, it's a technique called free space. Again, looking at, at you, this technique is very useful for planar kinds of, of materials like this. 
a different frequency range again, so at 325 gigahertz. Again, it's the quasi-optical. Here's the, the stimulus going through here, reflecting off the mirror to the detector, 325 gigahertz. On wafer measurements. So this is a lot of fun. So we work with a company called Cascade Microtech. So all the chips that we make, so when someone designs an amplifier and they want it to work at, at 60 gigahertz or 120 gigahertz, they want to know how it operates three times that frequency. So you start to see F sub T's of 500 gigahertz. So you have these little wafers. So this is actually a picture in our fab upstairs. You may recognize this, <laughs> Don. But uh, it's, and we're measuring right here. So this little wafer here has hundreds of little amplifiers operating 500 gigahertz that are in, in test. So. Milk pizza's here, I know. You can smell it, can't you? So millimeter wave terahertz development applications are growing. And, and it's a great thing for Keysight, but it's a, it's a great thing for electric, electrical and electronic engineers everywhere. It's driven by these commercial applications, a little bit by research. We talked about 5G, backhaul that supports communications, a little bit about defense and homeland security, There's even commercial radar for process control and imaging and, uh, and spectroscopy. The benefits of using these higher frequencies, much more bandwidth. You can use it with dense areas of populations and it's very efficient in the spectrum. And it's, of course, it's available. There's, there's no one has purchased 60 to 90 gigahertz yet. So there, there is available spectrum. And, and because of the size of the wavelengths, it's very small. You can make small little base stations and move them. There's new technologies. The promise of combining electronics with photonics. The reason I'm looking at that or investing in that is because it's, light's cheaper. I can move light a lot more cheaper, cheaply. So we're looking at that. It doesn't have the same performance. So I'm looking at more electrical solutions for the R&D area. And then when, the, when our, my customers are doing manufacturing, moving them to a much lower cost solution. So that's why I'm looking at the photonics. Much higher semiconductor operating frequencies. You know, CMOS up to 60 gigahertz is, is not, not a challenge anymore. And then lots of new measurement technologies that have been developed by, by not by me, but my team <laughs> in, uh, to, to make measurements at these frequencies or not because you, you, the general test equipment, you have to extend that frequency to those higher frequencies. And, and uh, you have, you know, bandwidths and, and cutoff frequencies and, and, uh, and when my stuff loves to test parts that have connectors on. They love to test parts that have a single frequency in and a single frequency out. That world is long behind us. It's, you know, it's, it's the original cell phone had one amplifier in it, it had, and it, was, it had filters, and it was all discrete components. Now it's a chip. And, and that, that's just a, 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 which is nice, but it makes it a lot more difficult to test because signals going everywhere. And the old tricks of how we do shielding and things like that all have to change. So I'm going to stop there and see if I can answer any questions. Uh, okay, one question. Uh, for these transceivers that uh, you're talking about, basically uh, the transmitter is going to send out maybe milliwatt, but then the incoming one to the receiver is going to be like microwatt and so on. Yeah. And then now here you're having, you have know, some problems if you want to, you know, test yeah. any of them. So how would you go about so In some cases that, we have external amplification. Yeah. So there's, a, there's additional, particularly out in the field, I've been to a few of these in right. Canada, right. and they have external amplifiers themselves okay. to, to boost, boost the energy. Okay. Okay. So it, it's just a smaller version of a typical base station. I, I see base stations everywhere when I walk, when I drive around them, because I, I, yeah. I know what's in them. Good customers for us, right. and uh, in other countries they do a much better job of, of hiding them, making them blend into the. If you're in Germany, it, I mean sometimes they're kind of hokey, but I mean, there's Christmas trees and everything. But it, they they make them blend into the environment, so you don't notice them unless you're looking for them. Here you see this tower, and you've got like eight. They look like giant speakers, right? Metal speakers. Those are base stations. 
you know, just lots of filters and amplifiers in every one of those things. On automotive radar, what's the power level that they're using and what's the range? Oh boy. I would just be guessing on the power level. The range is depending on which one of those. Yeah. So the ones that are doing speed control are on the order of a couple hundred meters. Okay. The ones that are doing lane changing are, I mean, they don't need the power, so it's a lot cheaper. They're, they're on the order of, of a couple meters. Okay. So it, it ranges in there. That's why they're, they're using different chips. Right. They, they start, it was too expensive to use the, the one, but it, it's in milliwatts. Okay. Yeah. The other question I have is, are people starting to talk about uh, regulation or licensing of the, some of these higher frequencies. Oh yeah, because that always comes along. Yeah, yeah. No, when absolutely. it gets crowded, you've got to have the regulation. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there's I, what I didn't show is on on five G. There's some. There's about five different consortiums now that have been created. Uh, some are more regionally focused. Some are are more company focused, and there, and and there is some good work. We're we're part of one to try to develop standards. So what, what are the bandwidths that are going to be available? What are the powers that are going to be? What, what are the modulation schemas or schemes that will be utilized? But it, absolutely, and government, and, and governments are involved too because, you know, you've heard of a, a spectrum auction? You know, so, yeah. US, you know, so if you're Verizon, one of your biggest costs are paying the United States government for use of that spectrum and that no one else can use it. That, that is huge money. In. All the, all the countries have figured that out. In the case of uh, the base station you were talking about, in, in, especially in the five gigahertz, when uh, in a football field you have, you have thousands of uh, you know communications on, basically the processing of this uh, this thing becomes a, 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 big, a big thing because it needs to handle all of these calls. Yeah. So, um, so, um, I mean. How, how will you go about the testing this year? I mean, because you're going to go really to a much higher processing and all of that. Yeah. So, so the, the the development of the of the communication technology is much wider band. So it's going to be able to handle right. these kind of data, the right. data required. If you know, if 100,000 people take a selfie and send it to grandma at the same time, it'll be able to do that right. compared to today. Yes. And, and, but uh, the testing is going to be done, you know, at the, at the when they're designing these base stations that will be in the stadiums. You're going to be testing at the component level, at the sub-assembly, and then at the full base station level. And then once it's at a stadium, how do they test it that it works then? That's a, that's a good question. Um, they, they don't hire 100,000 people to fill the stadium. <laughs> um, but we, what we do have is we have the ability to, to simulate phone calls. We can do phone calls to a tremendous amount. We haven't figured out the technology to test, um, you know, data at, at that kind of data. But there's we can use simulators that we have data communication simulators until until it's done. Okay. Yeah. This is more like a general question, but I was wondering, uh, what is your opinion? I do RF first, but that's me. <laughs> um, the photonics has a promise of being a lower cost technology, uh, but it's much more nascent, if that's the right word. Um, it, I, I, where, I, where I like photonics is combining it with the microwave. So it, there, there's some real problem where you can, you can generate the signal and then, and then go optical and then, and then go optical back to electrical. I think that the, there's much higher performance of the electrical measurements than there are of the of the optical. So I, I, I don't have that's not a good answer to your question. I I, I think the, the market out there is much bigger for RF and microwave than optical. Well, uh, when you go to the mobile thing and uh, uh, certainly the uh, the optics uh, not do it because optics is mainly for point to point whereas yeah. as they uh, micro is mainly for point to multipoint and right. so on, and, yeah. and also, uh, should say, mobile stuff. Yeah. 
yeah. for the mobile, you cannot use it. So there are two different type of applications yeah. altogether. Yeah. Probably both. Pretty <laughs> well versed in both. So I did. I had slides here, and I can talk about Keysight. I don't know if you're interested, but you know, Keysight is is a company that's been here since 1972. It's uh, was part of the original Hewlett Packard. So if you ever read about Hewlett Packard, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, they started in 1934, and the first product they made was actually an audio oscillator that was used by Disney Studios to simulate the theater sounds for Fantasia. So the original part of HP was test equipment. Then they made oscilloscopes and spectrum analyzers. And then, um, you know, about the 70s, HP got it. Well, in 72, they moved up here, this division that started here in Santa Rosa. And uh, then, then HP went off into, you know, computers and servers and consulting services and these little printer things. Um, but that and calculators. And so that had nothing to do with our business. 1999, HP... We, uh, Agilent, we split HP off into their own company, called it Hewlett Packard. They, they'd say they split us off, but HP became all about that computer stuff, and then we were 100% test, test and measurement or measurement company, and we had you know divisions that did uh, like all the CSI stuff you see, you know gas chromatographs, mass spectroscopy, all that stuff. That's now Agilent, and then we're the electronic test, which is it's 100% electronic test. So it's like Back to the Future. Great movie. Am I aging myself? It's a great movie. But it's where the original part of HP is now what Keysight Technologies is. And from the from our technicians all the way to the CEO, it's all about electronics. No one's worried about biolog you know, cancer research or biological um, sample preparation, chemical analysis, any of the food safety. That's that's agile technology. Interesting stuff, but different company. Yeah. In fact, you have had from HP to uh, to side you have three split. I mean, no, two splitting, right? Yeah. That's in fact what happened with AT&T in 1984. They split the AT&T into wide band, sorry, uh, wide area network, and then yeah. also the local area network. And of course, they, yeah. they uh, I mean, the manufacturing of the equipment. And then in 96, then we had the N split to the NCR, yeah. and then also the Lucent Technologies, and yeah. Italy, so it's yeah. same. Now the pizza is here. Um, uh, 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 I would like to thank uh, uh, Henry for giving such a lively, really, I mean, I, I didn't enjoy it. I mean, it was really so lively as well. Because when you look at, think about micro, microwave and so on, here and so on, soon you will get lost, but not, this case. So let's thank him for giving such a such a uh, informative and also interesting talk and lively and, and